And I just turned around and I hauled ass out of there. I was, I was done. I wasn't dealing with that. The hypocrisy of the cult is one of the things that turned me away the quickest. When I turned my headlights on, it turned and looked at us. And one of the things I remember the most were the eyes were glowing red. I see an orb of light. It is just circling these steps like it is waiting for me. And he begins to tell them uh, that he saw a UFO. They're basically like, what are you talking about? That's seven foot up on a tree, peeking around it. And that's where I saw the top of the muzzle, nose, and the eyes. As soon as I made eye contact with this thing, it felt like death. Welcome back to Tinfoil Tales. I'm your host, Brandon Wright. Tonight, we're going to be joined by my guest, Juan. Juan is the host of Juan on Juan podcast. He dives into a lot of esoteric and occultist type things. So I've been looking forward to talking with him, diving into some of the things he talks about. Before we bring him on, if you've ever had an experience and you'd like to be on an episode of Tinfoil Tells, there's a couple things you can do. You can email me at tinfoiltellspodcast at gmail.com, or you can go to tinfoiltells.com and send me a message through the contact section. Or if you're on Facebook, you can look for Brandon Tinfoil Tells, and you can send me a message that way too. Whatever it is you got to do, though, make sure to get your message to me. We'll get something scheduled for a future episode. If you'd like to help podcast out, please continue to share it around because word of mouth is one of the best ways of helping the podcast. The more people find the podcast, the more chances are someone else has a story to share that they want to come on here and share that with the audience. You can also help out the podcast by leaving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts at. If you'd like to join the Patreon, you can help out that way. Become a member and get access to all the episodes ad-free up to two months early. You get exclusive content like the live videos and access to Crinkle Conspiracies for all for just $1.99 a month. But if you join the free tier, you still get access to Crinkle Conspiracies. So it's worth checking out the Patreon. You can find more information about that in the show notes. Make sure to follow me around on all social medias. As I mentioned earlier, Brandon Tenfoil Tells is the profile I've been using to interact with people. So make sure to reach out on there if you want to. I do have shirts available and some other merch. If you'd like to purchase one, you can go to the merch store that is available or you can reach out to me directly because I do have some in stock. So again, same way you can reach out to me via getting on the show. You can also reach out to me for a shirt. But I think now we're going to go ahead and bring Juan on. I've been looking forward to talking with him. I hope you guys enjoy our conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'd like to take the time to welcome my guest tonight, Juan. Thanks for coming on here and talking to me. Yeah, dude, thank you for having me, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, not a problem. You want to let the audience know a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Juan from the Juan on Juan podcast. And on my podcast, I always tell people, I always talk about whatever I feel like talking about, but that usually falls in the in the line of alchemy, the occult, esoteric. I consider myself an occult historian, and I like to talk about interesting stuff that is not talked about as much as I'd like it to be. <laughs> mm-hmm. you what know, got how... you? What got you into the wanting to do all that? Like, there's something to set you down that pathway. So I grew up ver- very religious in a Pentecostal household, and I played guitar for over five years at my church in the worship group. And there was just questions that I would ask that I wouldn't get the correct. Not the correct answer, because it's never going to be a correct answer, but an answer that really fit and and helped me and actually answered something for me. And it, it always felt empty. And the one that really did it for me was, don't read the book of Enoch, because you'll get possessed by demons. And I was like, what? Well, why would the why would the Bible, the canon, reference something that's non-canon? Like, what, what's all that about? Like, well, you know, there's a lot of books. So then I started digging into the, the Nag Hammadi, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Gnostics, and I soon learned that all the stories that had been told growing up, there's the complete opposite of that in some text, you know, that's X amount of years old. 
And it made me wonder, I go, so if these people are saying that, how do we know that our stuff is the right stuff? How can we truly know it? And how can you truly know the truth if you haven't explored any other avenue? You're just looking at something from one perspective. It kind of sort of starts turning into an echo chamber. So that really set me off learning about the Gnostics. And it really started with my religious upbringing. Now, I still consider myself a Christian, but I'm a little bit more open minded. I'm not as dogmatic. And I've talked to multiple different people throughout my podcasting career. You know, uh, people from all walks of life, occultists, non-occultists, Satanists, non-Satanists, witches, whatever, like all different sorts of people. And I want to hear what everyone has to say. And I was, I looked for shows that I wanted to hear stuff about, and there just wasn't any that really piqued my interest or were covering the subjects that I wanted to learn about. So I took it upon myself to create my show. And here we are about five years later, Still going at it. And yeah, I didn't think, honestly, didn't think it was going to get this far, but here we are and having a great time doing it. Yeah, I started this about two years ago. It's funny you mentioned the Pentecostal thing because that's how I grew up too. I grew up in a Pentecostal church and I'm not a religious person now. I have my beliefs or whatever, but I'm not like an acting, I don't go to church or anything like that. I, I still have my belief systems. But no, like when it comes to the church vibes or whatever, I've always, and this is just me being myself as I don't try and offend anyone out, but I feel like to have a relationship with God, you don't have to go to the church. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's just kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. God is everywhere and you can tap into God or let God in anywhere you are. It's the problem is that it's a brokered experience and they've learned to what a lot, what a lot of occultists throughout history have tried to do. And they're, they're bottling God and trying to break them down into a substance. And they found a way to hack the system. So it's like, Hey, you can only achieve divinity through us when in actuality, right? You've turned my, my father's house into a den of, a den of thieves it's like he was against all that you know he was flipping tables and doing all craziness it's like he was against the very thing that you guys and dude whenever i talk about like some religious aspect any religious idea whether that be the, ne the nephilim or whether that be some weird shape-shifting jesus story or whatever it is uh, that there's i mean there's a, there's plenty of stories whenever i have whenever i have pushback from people because usually people are pretty vocal when it comes to the religious stuff if one person is unhappy with whatever i said i just remember and i go oh wait there's forty five thousand different denominations of christianity i'll be all right forty five thousand <laughs> denominations don't agree on one set of books like they 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 extracted forty five thousand different interpretations of these books of these texts so if one person doesn't agree with what I said, I'll be all right. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's, it's, that's how wild it is. And I, and I go, how can you truly know that what you're talking about is the thing, you know, without looking at everything else, like you have to look at everything else. You have to leave no stone unturned when it comes to the, the pursuit of truth, because the truth will set you free. And ever since then, I know I think I know less than I did when I first started after doing all the research and hours and hours of, of content that I put out, um, over the 200th episode, I think I'm on 210 now, plus other offshoots and other appearances. And so, yeah, I'm still going at it and I don't think we'll ever really know until it's, it's over, you know, when we pass on to the other side. And even then, I don't know if we'll really know because like my dad, he had a, a, uh, he died four times. He had a heart attack. His heart stopped four times. He was clinically dead four separate times. And when he came back, the first thing I asked him was like, yo, so how, what, what was it like? Like, what'd you see? Did you see the light? Did you walk away from the light? Like, what did you see? He goes, nothing. Damn, dude. You ain't died <laughs> once. 
He didn't die twice. He died four times. And you didn't see nothing. He's like, I didn't see nothing. I've had that conversation before with people, and I I recently mentioned it on an episode, but you know how we always envision an afterlife. Like when you die, you see something. Like you want to see something. I was like, what happens if we actually die and there was nothing? But we would never really know. I was like, that is the scary thought. And I think that's why a lot of people have faith to an extent because they want the hope that there is something more. Because if we were just to die and there's just nothingness, that's pretty bleak. Like to think about, and that turns... I talked about this when I was a teenager, back doing teenage things that are taken in those types of things. So I, I ruined the mood for everyone because I got in that deep thought and everyone's like, dude, shut up. <laughs> because they didn't want to talk about that type of stuff. But I was like, that's just where my mind kind of went off to. I was like, man, what if we just like, you go to sleep and you never wake up and then you never know that yeah. you even died. Like you died in your sleep and it's just, you're just gone. Yeah. And that's the thing that we're never going to know until you're there. And in my opinion, maybe it's not so bad because you know you don't remember nothing you know what i'm saying like you don't remember mm -hmm. being nothing it's not gonna hurt it's not gonna be anything so maybe we should embrace it maybe but i don't know because there is an aspect of the human experience and we see this throughout throughout multiple ancient cultures that they were preparing for something in the afterlife they were mummifying their dead to maybe perhaps at some point in time maybe revive them again reincarnate them re something right recycle them whatever it was or something about the vessel they still kept it and and we're talking about very 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 superstitious people so was it just that was it just hocus pocus fairy tales and i think that what I always tell people, because, you know, the first thing that people talk about is like, oh, this is all BS. There's no, you know, there's no such thing as the occult. There's no such thing as, as, as magic. There's no such thing as any of that. And I go, that's fine if you don't believe it. But the dudes in power, the dudes that are in the White House, the dudes that are in the government, those dudes are dressing up and they're going in front of an owl statue in the middle of the woods. Some are running around naked, some aren't. And they're doing ceremonies and role playing and larping so there's got to be something to it even mm -hmm. if it even if even if it is some sort of mnemonic technique you know where it's like you're preparing your mind you know if you're preparing you know your state of consciousness or something there, there's something with the mind even even right understanding consciousness understanding the soul understanding memory understanding all these different aspects that make us human we still don't know about right so we still don't know about ourselves but then they want us to wrap our minds and our heads around the idea of the deity or the entity or the thing that is controlling our very reality itself if we don't even understand ourselves to begin with like there's things about the human experience that we don't know about i mean i just did a, a short today i was writing out the 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 script about how 50 to 70% of people don't have an inner monologue. Now, that's not indicative that you don't have a soul or that you're a homunculus or whatever it is, but we don't know why some people can hear themselves in their head thinking and why some can't. And they just classify it as a characteristic. So are those people NPCs? Are those people here for texture where they quite literally can't visualize things in their mind. I don't know about you. I, I visualize when I'm reading, I read in my head and I hear my, I hear myself in my head reading. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got a whole fight club situation going on, seek help. <laughs> when I'm talking <laughs> about the voice in your head that you can control, where you can say things inside your head without saying them out loud. Do you have that? I, I have it, but like when I'm, I was sitting here thinking like, when I read things, I hear myself mm -hmm. and I've talked to people before and the whole, I never knew people didn't have an inner monologue up until recently. Mm -hmm. And I've wanted to actually talk to someone that said they didn't have one. I've never been able to track that down because for me, it seems strange that you wouldn't be able to, 
Like if you're reading a book, like you said, I hear myself reading it. And it, even you kind of just mentioned it, so maybe I need to get myself checked. But I've read like from different characters, and for some reason their voices change just a little bit when yeah. I'm reading it. So it's like it's hard for me to con- like understand someone not being able to do that. Yeah, that was first talked about in like the late 19th century. And then it was left alone till like the mid 2000s. Like then nobody looked into it. It was like 18 something or other. It was this one guy. And then he was like, yeah, some of my peers don't have an inner monologue. How strange. And then nobody touched the research for like, like till 2005. And then another time in 2012, uh, 2010, something like that. So it's like, it's this aspect of one thing about being a person that you think to you is a normal thing. So you think everyone else is the same as you making that assumption is the first mistake that you make. Like everyone else is like me, everyone else. I think when I post something on the internet that I think is super dope, again, I think a majority of the internet is bots, but there's a lot of people who interact negatively with it. Like, Oh, that was stupid. Take your meds. You're schizophrenic. It's like, how do people not find the things, you know, history interesting. It's funny. You mentioned that because my episode that dropped today, I was, listening back to it and I mentioned in the episode because I record I'm almost six to eight weeks ahead of what I release schedule is so when it came out I'd talked to the guest and I'd mentioned that someone had reached out to me as multiple people in the same day that told me they were God which was weird I had three different people within a 48 hour span that said they were a God one lady said that she heard voices in her head and she's no longer understands that she's crazy everyone says she's crazy because she hears all these voices she's actually God and all the voices she's hearing are the people that are praying to her. I was like, that's, I was like, I don't, it don't sound like schizophrenia to me, but like, but how, how do you know our schizophrenics? How do you know that their brains don't work the way it's supposed to? You ever heard of the bicameral mind theory, the mind bicameral mind. Mm -mm. Uh, So back then the, the, the brain used to operate you know, in, in two halves, one half would be yourself. And then the other half was this other voice, this, this thing that people would perceived as the ancestors or God or whatever it is. Well, what if, because the first thing that they do to a schizophrenic person is what they put them on med, boom, put them on meds, lock it down. You can't hear that. What if again, they're tapping in. I've talked to a schizophrenic person where they say that these entities show them things on a screen about themselves. Now, I don't know if it's information that he he didn't have prior to the entity showing him. But again, how do we not know that they're not tapping into another dimension? Or I'm not saying that she is God. I mean, we don't know that either. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the truth is stranger than the fiction. But I'm saying what if like there's we don't understand there's like, oh, it's a chemical imbalance. Really? I mean, that's all it is, just a chemical imbalance. We we I believe that the brain is one of the 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 most powerful supercomputers that there is. And I think that a lot of the ancients they talked about how Plato, for example, talked about how we know everything. We already know everything. We're simply remembering over again. Okay. I talked to someone recently about the whole Plato and the cave thing. Yeah. And I'm not a hundred percent familiar about, I, I knew the basis of it, but like this person was talking to me about it and we we're talking about UFOs and aliens for whatever reason. And it made sense to the think that his exact words, and I'm going to quote him here. It was the things that we're seeing here in the third dimension are actually the aliens from the fourth dimension coming down here and fucking with us. <laughs> I was like, Okay. And th- this was an older gentleman, so when he said that, it kind of took me. I wasn't expecting that from him. But he said that's the he, the thesis of, like, Plato's cave. We're all trying to get out of this cave, but he don't, we don't understand that, like, there's other things going on around with the cave in search situation. Like, we see the puppets, but who's actually the ones pulling the puppet strings? And I'm like, you know, I've never really thought of it that way, but it does make sense. And then when you bring up schizophrenia and people that talk, they hear voices or they actually see things that we don't see. What if they're tapping into that side to where they're seeing the stuff on those other realities, those other dimensions that we're not able to 
do with our brains the way they are right now. Yeah, and the the guy that does escape out of the cave goes out and goes, what is this? There's a whole other world. He goes back in and he tells his boys like, yo, there's a whole other reality. And what do they do? They fight him. They go, no, you're crazy, dude. We want to stay mm -hmm. here. We want to sit in front and look at the shapes on the wall because that's all we've ever known. And that's essentially what's happening nowadays with society, with everyone else. The what you know, I don't like to use the term normies, but the people who don't look into whatever it is that we're looking into like on your show, you get into a lot of things that people wouldn't even begin to understand. I wouldn't even begin to comprehend. It's all fairy tales, and and that's fine too. Like sometimes, I wish I wouldn't have gotten into all this stuff because you see the occult symbolism and you see all this esoteric occult lore that's put into everything that we watch. I mean, you know, I have two small sons, freaking watching Paw Patrol with them. I mean, there's occult stuff in that. I mean, Paw Patrol. The latest movie was they found this moon rock that gave them all powers, and they were like getting these powers from these these talismans these things that came from outer space and it was like an evil villain who was trying to get the powers and all this other. that's it. ideas of the occult you know magical powers and powering yourself up to make yourself more powerful so being involved in all these topics i see all that and you can't really it's like in the matrix the dude just yeah. wants to eat a steak because i know it's not real but it tastes great and mm -hmm. ignorance is bliss. So I get it, you know, but I, I randomly will make comments here and there. I think I, I think my family probably thinks I'm out there a little bit too far at this point, but there are certain things and I will mention stuff. And I have four kids, so 13, 11, five, and soon to be three. And I'll make comments about certain things because, again, my show also dives into conspiracies and cover-ups. Some of the kids will come home from school and they'll talk about certain things. They'll be like, eh, that's not really true. My wife's like, don't, just shut up. <laughs> because I was like, whatever, I'm just trying to tell them the real stories, but you know. But I've noticed things, too, like on shows, and I've been to, like, older cartoons, mm -hmm. like, there's just a lot of weird things that were, were in cartoons that nowadays, like my kids watch a lot of Bluey and all that type of stuff. So I don't really pay a whole lot of attention, but there's all sorts of symbolism in almost everything. And like you said, once you start going down these things and you start seeing these things and it's like, what do you, as a parent, what do you do? It's, you don't want to expose your kids to it, but at the same time, they don't even understand it. So it's just like, whatever. But. Not yet. I mean, they don't understand it yet, but it's like, I believe that a lot of things are passed down genetically regardless. I think that well, uh, beliefs are passed down genetically. I think that fears are passed down genetically. I think that ideas as well could be passed down genetically. And I think that it's gotten to the point already where they may not know it now, but as soon as they remember, they'll understand it. And maybe the intent isn't for them to understand it now. Maybe it's, again, this other aspect of the human experience of what if it's meant to just stay in the subconscious? Because these magicians, the what I've dubbed the sorcerers of the subconscious, they work in the subconscious. They don't work in the conscious realm. It's all about imprinting these things on this other side that emerges every now and again and the intent is to imprint it on the other side in order for you to forget about it so it does become true because once you forget because forgetting that it's even there right out of sight out of mind is part of that magical operation you know from from what i've learned through my hours and hours of study into the occult I mean, that's the whole premise behind sex magic, where it's about imprinting the subconscious, bringing it forth at the point of orgasm, printing it, it goes back in, and then you let it marinate essentially, and it becomes true later on. And that's just one method of many different magical systems. And I mean, there's numerous magical systems because 
magic, in my opinion, is a sort of force that you're able to tap into. Like the movie Star Wars, you know, you can tap into and be a good guy, be a Jedi, or you can tap into and be a Sith, a Sith Lord. But essentially, you're all tapping into one thing. And the power is, you know, in the, in the, the wielder, whatever, you know, the spear of destiny, it can either kill you or heal you. You know, it's what you use it for. So I think that's also part of it. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's there. It makes for a good story. It could be like how Young said, archetypes. But why are the archetypes there? You know, why are all these monomyths and all these things there to begin with? Why can we all resonate with these stories that are essentially recycled over and over and over again? And they've been told over a thousand times in Hollywood and they still keep making the same garbage <laughs> just under different titles. I so, interviewed someone recently that was a practitioner of magic. And for some reason, like when I think magic, obviously when you think of, nowadays, you think of like street magic, the magicians you see out there, like your David Blaine's and your Chris Angels or whatever. I always just say they're illusionists. I don't say that's like magic or whatever. They're just tricksters or whatever. This guy claims he was practicing. He practices magic. He said the curses are real. You can do things to people, this and that. I'm still trying to wrap my head around. I, I keep getting people reaching out to me, and I haven't scheduled anything, but they are Reiki, Reiki, however they pronounce masters or whatever. Never even heard of that stuff until like the last couple of years. But they claim that they can, your body's energies, they manifest the energy, they can send the energies of this and that. Is that not almost like magic? To an extent, like they're using someone's energies. Now, magician people that I talk, they claim that's not the same thing because they say they talk with spirits and they use the spirits energies and this and that. I don't know how familiar you are with that aspect to like the Reiki aspect, but isn't it all somewhat similar? Yeah, I think that there is because there's a distinction to be made. I do think that there are what they call subtle energies. And I do think that there are and I want to talk about it from a 16th century alchemical perspective, Ma magical alchemical perspective, because this is how they viewed it. Because they were they were doing both at the same time. They were they were they were doing alchemy and they were doing magic at the same time. And the way that they were able to get away with it, because these guys were church doctors and theologians and people of the of the faith. And the way that they were able to get, get away with it, they called it Christian magic. And what Christian magic was, it was mat natural magic, magia naturalis, which is essentially if God put it in nature, if I put A plus B and I get C, it's okay because God put that there and he wouldn't have put it there. If he wouldn't have wanted me to interact with it. I was just able to de-occult hidden aspects within nature. Okay, I was able to find a glitch in the matrix using nature. Now, the issue would come in when they would use astral influences or goetic, demonic, whatever it is, in the assistance of said ceremony. So if you're calling upon the Goetia of XYZ and you're using those daemons or demons to assist you in your whatever, obviously, right, the Faustian pact, you got to give something up in order to get something in return, that's when it was bad because you were using the devil or anything else. So these people at the Reiki, I've heard about it before. I think it's a form of, in my opinion, a form of, I guess, therapy. But it's like on the, it's on the, it's on the border of like being a cult. So it's like kind of woo woo, but not really. Do I believe in it? I think anything is possible. I think that you can achieve healing through frequencies and all this other stuff. And I think that there is a lot that has been occulted because of, you know, big farm. I've seen that firsthand uh, with my father's health. You know, like there's a lot of things that it's like, yeah, it's a 30 day supply of this medicine is like $50,000. Well, what about the people who don't have health coverage or how, like what happens to them? It's like, well, MS doesn't kill you, but eventually it'll just, 
your body will just degrade to the point where you're bedridden and you become a vegetable and then your lungs stop. It's like, wow, what a slow, painful death for somebody who isn't able to afford that. And then you got the people that's like, oh, I, I smoke this certain herb that grows with water, sun, and dirt, and it heals me. Like, you know, I, I don't have any symptoms. It's like, what does that mean? Like, it means everything's been there since the beginning. I think God put everything on this earth for us to heal ourselves. And I don't know, Reiki might be another facet of that. Again, I don't understand it enough. But that's the way I've come to understand the occult magic. And I think these guys that talk about curses and all that stuff, maybe they believe. And again, this is going back to what I said at the beginning where, you know, yeah, I used the power of lamb to whatever, you know, to do this. And it's like, okay. And it worked. Cool. Well, I think that you believe that it worked and that's what did it for you. You know, because I I do I do think that there is it's all about the state of mind, state of consciousness, and and, and again, this is why we don't understand enough about reality that maybe the mind or the consciousness or, or the subconscious have an effect on reality. So the way I've come to understand the occult, it's got multiple facets, but one of the aspects that I like the most is about entering a certain state of mind to think about something, and if it's true to you. It'll eventually become a reality, right? You you manifest it. And to me, that's called chaos magic. And what I love about chaos magic, because magical systems are meant to be evolved. And if you study magic, you see the piggybacking of, of all the systems. And the example that I always use is John D. and Edward Kelly and the use of Enochian. Well, it jumped over to the Golden Dawn and then... Go with the non Crowley took it, and Crowley took it. Parsons used it with L. Ron Hubbard, and then from there, it's still being used, but it's it's evolved through its entirety, the entirety of its life, and it's been Frankenstein. It's been it's a chimera of the original system, right? It's it, it was used. You know, they took the original system and they used the parts that they liked, and then they inserted their own parts and they used it like that because again, you're tapping into something, and you're able to extract it using these systems so again i think it's about entering a state of mind and in chaos magic which is one of these systems that it's one of my favorites because it's like forget about all the ceremonial larping bs and just believe and the problem with that is that that makes it that much more dangerous because we're talking about what are they putting in our kids cartoons what are they putting in our kids tv shows what are they putting in all these other things well it turns out that chaos magicians are able to adopt any how do i explain this they're able to adopt things for a certain amount of time use them for their ceremonial purposes and then discard them because it's all about intent and belief so they don't care about doing your magic circles and your magic rituals and dressing up in your garb and your regalia and all this other stuff. It's like, no, just use your mind. And it'll, and I, so I always said, our money says with all these sigils on it and God, we trust. Well, what God is that? We all assume it's the God of the Bible. Well, <laughs> we look back in history, a lot of the founding fathers and all the early presidents we're part of secret societies and occult orders and secret groups. How do we know that they weren't worshiping something else? Because according to chaos magic, you're able to adopt something for a set ceremony or a set working. And then after you're done, you discard it. That's why these dudes are using the Lovecraftian mythos, bro, to do their ceremonies and praying to Yog sagoth and Cthulhu and Dagon <laughs> and all these other, because they were like, yeah, H.P. Lovecraft, that was all real. He was tapping into something from beyond and bringing it forth or something was tapping in through him trying to break through our reality. And we use these entities in our magical workings. I mean, dude, I've been to virtual mystery schools where there are entire altars and entire setups where people do rituals in VR. 
Okay. So it's, again, it's all about intent, belief. And I think there's something about that, that concept that, you know, William, William Burroughs, uh, one of the famous chaos magicians and really, really degenerate. I wish he wasn't so interesting. Really, I really wish he wasn't. He was also a PDF file, you know, not to say the word, but he was also one of those. And he wrote a lot of heinous stuff when you really read read his books. I don't know why he is famous, but William Burroughs talk, did this this lecture. And I think he was talking about the monkey paw and the idea of, of wishing. And then he, he said that he came across a machine that it's in a book. I, I did a reel on it. And this machine, allegedly, you're able to construct it and it's able to make your wishes come true. And it was something about the machine, again, throwing throwing everything out else out. It's like, what if you focusing like, okay, now I have a physical medium, you know, I have this contraption essentially is what it is that I built. And I believe that this thing is going to amplify my wishes and it's going to make them come true. By you being in that state of mind of like this physical medium is the thing that's going to make my... Now, he talked about the machine and how it made some of his wishes come true and how there's there's laws and parameters that you got to follow, whatever, whatever. Now, if we take that same analogy of the wishing machine and we just extrapolate it, all right, let's zoom out. The concept of a church having an altar and having a congregation and, ha and and being laid out in a certain type of geometrical way, because, I mean, all churches are laid out in a certain type of way. And you can look up Pythagorean palaces and the use of architecture as a talisman. And it's the same thing. It's about the concentration of intent. At one point, you always go to church on Sunday, the same time. You some, some people do the same prayers over and over again. What if it's like that? What if you're just putting your wish in the well? Sometimes yours gets picked, sometimes it doesn't. But it's about, again, the manipulation of subtle energies. And the subtle energies, I don't know. I mean, I've wondered if the subtle energies are conscious or not. Or what it is. <laughs> I was going, when you were talking about the church and everything, it, it is. Sunday was always considered the day that God rested, wasn't it? That's. That's the story. The, the story is seventh day God rested. What part did it say that's when you had to go to church? I don't remember where that <laughs> came about. But that's been come like the sacred day is like the yep. holy day is your Sunday, but that was the day that God rested, but you have to go to church, but it's been implemented for so many years now that that's what everyone does. And then you're on that routine. Yep. So, so again, a lot of things that people use, bro. And I mean, I've talked about this a lot, especially when it comes to technology. We were using a lot of things that we don't even understand what they were intended for to begin with. I mean, the internet was created by CERN. You know, all the, the conspiracies regarding that. <laughs> yeah. And the first people involved in, in technology, I mean, there was all about proving the existence of deity, proving the existence of, of Satan or the devil. I mean, I, uh, I always talk about Charles Babbage and how he, as a little boy recited the Lord's prayer backwards and cut his hand in, in a circle trying to summon the devil. And he asked God, you know, if you're real, show me the devil, you know, show yourself. Or I think it was the devil. One of the, I maybe get to get confused, but he writes about this in, in a book. And I think that he did succeed. I have other evidence that he succeeded in summoning the devil, but this is the guy that was behind one of the first computers uh, Leibniz, the guy who's behind essentially calculus and, and binary code, which is the ones and zeros that your computer works off of, he was deep into alchemy, deep into, into the metaphysics of reality, the metaphysics of man. 
and he was obsessed with <laughs> stories of transmutation. He was going around Europe looking for stories of transmutations. He was obsessed with Rene Descartes' work, which I think that Rene Descartes was also into the occult. But again, what we're presented in the mainstream history, they don't talk about that. They don't talk about Isaac Newton being obsessed with the apocalypse, being obsessed with drawing up and finding the Temple of Solomon, being doing commentaries on the book of Revelation, predicting the end of the world they don't talk about any of that it's like that doesn't fit our narrative like we you got to believe in our stuff and all these other guys that it, if they did or didn't exist because that's another that's a whole nother rabbit hole of mm -hmm. how falsified is history and and i'm down with that too but it's like you got to have something to measure it out There's, so i've actually gotten down that rabbit hole here recently with one of my friends of what part of history is real and what part of history has been changed? Because I feel like history has been changed. <laughs> you hear these wars and everything else. Like you only hear about the winning side. Like at the history at that points from whatever it happened. Like whoever won that war. But throughout, just throwing this back to the Bible. I've You mentioned the book of Enoch before. That was never considered part of the Bible. But I think it is in Ethiopia though. They still have it in their yeah. Bible. There's other gospels that were left out of it too. And then some of these other gospels were written hundreds of years after the fact, like the new Testament, like a lot of these things were a couple hundred years after like Jesus or whatever. I have an episode. I interviewed someone that or it's two guys. They wrote a book called Christ before Jesus. And they're basically saying in their book from their research and everything that they talked about a Christ, but then Jesus would basically a fictionalized version, like a character they made just to have for the New Testament. And I wasn't there, so I don't know like, who wrote the Bible, who wrote the books, but they did all the analysis or whatever. But it gets you thinking like, how many times have things been rewritten and changed in the first place? And when it comes to organized religion, and this is where I piss people off, I feel like a lot of organized religion is mainly just to control people. Like, they put that in place to try and keep people in line to whatever rules. And like you just mentioned, 45,000 different denominations of Christianity. And they all have their own certain rules that you have to follow, their own certain belief systems and everything. That's just one religion, like one concept of religion. But there's 45,000 different denominations. Of that Think about all the other religions in the world and all the other. What if the God, the, the creator, the ultimate creator, and I'm not trying to make it sound like simulation theory matrix stuff but it, it, to me it almost bleeds into that what if the ultimate creator is the designer he designed our universe he designs the world we live in whatever that is the one god all these other religions have their god maybe it's all the same god but then everyone else came into play and they've tried to control that narrative with the people so they've put in their own implementation like their own thoughts their own opinions their own things to try and control everyone to their own stamp what they want so you have all these different religions bleeding into it, but it all comes back to the same fact that it's made to try to control people for someone else's personal benefit. There's various places you can go with that, but the it's interesting that they wrote that book, the the, the Christ what was it the Christ before Jesus? Is that what you said? Christ before Jesus. It, it literally just came out in March. That's an interesting concept because I've even seen certain grimoires that talk about maybe perhaps these messiahs being, again, another sort of technology. Now, treading lightly because it's a, it's a blasphemous and heretical standpoint, but if you look at all the starting points of, and, and, I, and I agree with you, I, I think that maybe a lot of these religions are looking at the same phenomenon from different perspectives and depending on your, on your mimetic upbringing, because mimetics, you know, creates culture, depending on your culture is how you view this, this certain phenomenon. So for, you know, in India, it looks like this in China, it looks like this in Japan, mm -hmm. it looks like this. 
and Australia looks like this, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of these messiahs, a lot of these figures, right, during the axial age, that was even a real point in time, you had the birth of all these figures that or were the chosen ones or the Buddhas or the whatever, and they all kind of sort of have similar origin stories, right? And you see parallels between ancient civilizations that are separated by large bodies of water that they couldn't have, you know, different time periods. And they all have the sort of same architecture and sort of similar names and all, you know, there's, there's a lot of connections that, that could be made, but I've seen as far as the concept of, again, these messiahs, Crowley talked about birthing a, a, the new messiah into reality, you know, using his, magical method and he talked about the ubermensch and the superman and he even considered frederick nietzsche a saint in thelema right uh, uh, a, he called it a, he called him a saint and something else but he looked at him like this dude speaking you know my language in some sort of way and again you'd think that something the philosophy of nietzsche being infused with the magical system of Crowley, you know, it taps on all the things that we've been talking about where they take these other concepts and they implement them into their magical order or their magical system for whatever, for whatever reason. So he did take the Ubermensch concept from Nietzsche and, and tried to do it for real. He's like, so the overman, I can create this thing. I can create a Messiah and birth them into reality and bring upon Ragnarok or the apocalypse or whatever the hell he was trying to do. But that's what Jack Parsons was doing too. He believed that doing the Babylon working, which essentially came from a book, Moonchild from Crowley, that he was saving this reality. He was balancing reality out by bringing in the Scarlet Woman, the whore of Babylon, Babylon being this female deity in the Thelemic religion that by bringing her into this existence he was evening things out and now it's interesting to know that Parsons was at the center of NASA, JPL all these other things and <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard was right there with him along the way we know what L he, what he made I mean it's one of the mm -hmm. my opinion one of the biggest psyops there is if it, if it doesn't scream psyop I don't know what will. You know. <laughs> I've been careful to mention that too much. I don't want to get uh, cease and desist letters in the mail from them. <laughs> but I think you'll be all right, bro. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's funny to me that uh, when you mentioned NASA, there is a lot of weird stuff when it comes to NASA in general. And I recently saw something that completely off topic. But the whole moon landing stuff, they claim, obviously, there's, it's fake, whatever. And there was someone saying it's not fake, and then there's the stuff that they actually found on the moon, and that's why we don't go back. I was like, does anyone... Is, I have my own personal beliefs. But what is the significance of why they stopped going to the moon? And like I said, this is completely off topic, like... We went to the moon. You don't really hear about the other missions to the moon. You heard about the first one, and then there's like several other ones that went there, and then they just completely stopped. And then they destroyed the technology before they ever went back. They said because they didn't want to fall into the wrong hands. And no one has ever been back since up until recently. They've landed some, like China, I think, landed something there. I think Japan supposedly landed something. But no other country's ever put a person on the moon, to the best of my knowledge, that I'm aware of. Why did it all stop in the early 70s? And why has it been so hard for everyone else to get there? But we managed to get there in 1969 on the first try. Yeah. There's been a total of 12 men on the moon. Yeah. Seven missions. 12, seven. Those are esoteric numbers in the occult. <laughs> and I think that space, I always say space is fake and gay. And what I mean by that is that 
space isn't what they've told us. And in my opinion, studying all the occult, studying all the esoteric, the space plays a a role in that. They use it for occult rituals and purposes. Now, if you look at the astronaut, I guess, initiation, I think that something happens that they can only send somebody into space, you know, X amount of times before something happens to them. I mean, you know, use your imagination, whatever it is. We're not going to really ever going to know the truth about what is really out there. But I think that it was, I think it was 100% faked. And I think that there is a firmament they can't get through. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and say 100% that it's flat. You know, like the the world is flat. I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think it's, I don't think it's flat. I think it's something. If, if anything, there's more evidence, and this is always pisses people off. There's more evidence, and I'll say this loud and clear, there's more evidence of hollow earth than there is of flat earth, in my opinion. Because you can take me to hollow earth. I can go into entire forests, an entire cave, mammoth cave system. One of the, they don't know where it ends, bro. <laughs> they mm -hmm. don't know where it where it goes to and where it connects to. There's entire forests and entire ecosystems underground. Okay. So I think that that's more possible. Now, it could be flat and hollow. I mean, that could also be another uh, aspect of it. But I do think that there is something that they can't break through. Now, the truth is stranger than fiction a lot of times. And... I don't think that we've been there and I think that everyone's in on it. And, and the reason that they say, you know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons as to why they, why we haven't gone back. Well, it's too expensive nowadays. It's like the equivalent to, I don't know how many billions or almost trillions of dollars of today. I think it was an equivalent because I recently did a reel on it or it was like the equivalent to, I don't know how many billions at in 1969. And then the whole concept of losing the technology and the people who believe in the moon landing, why do you believe in it? Because an organization, a governmental agency organization told you that it happened and they showed you some videos of it. Dude, have you seen the AI and what that can do nowadays? That's the stuff that they're letting out. Yeah. That means that they've had this technology for a very, very long time. And people go, oh, well, the CGI in 2000, blah, blah, blah. It was garbage, yeah. Because that's not government. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not the good stuff. That's the stuff that, that's the exo, what I call the exoteric, what they present to everybody. The esoteric stuff is behind closed doors, probably in underground military bases, in my opinion. But, yeah, it's just ridiculous to think that they lost the technology. <laughs> We're not able to go back. I mean... <laughs> That, that's I've been saying for years and again people think I'm crazy because I said we didn't go to the moon because it doesn't make, any, make sense of why we went there why did we stop going why did how did we manage to make it there in the first time and just recently I read something and Elon Musk claims that the, in order to get to the moon they're going to have to refuel a rocket on the way to the moon which if space I'm, I'm not a scientist by any means if space is a vacuum once you get outside the gravity of earth you're going to be continuing on at the same speed why would you have to refuel your rocket to keep going wouldn't it just keep going at the same i also don't understand how stuff like how does stuff burn in a vacuum like if there's no oxygen out there how are you burning fuel through it mm -hmm. like there's certain things like i said i'm not a i'm just a high school guy i went to high school and i had chemistry <laughs> like but there's just certain things about it that doesn't add up and when I bring this up to people, they just get really pissed off at me because I don't know if it's because they think I'm just trying to shit all over their belief, but it's like, even as a kid, I just don't under, I never really thought we went to the moon. Yeah. No, I mean, then allegedly they've tested the rocks that came from there and they were turned out to be like petrified wood or something or other. And the one that really gets me is the interviews that they did of them when they came back and how unenthusiastic they looked the entire time. And it's like, you just did one of the greatest things 
allegedly in human history and you look like that mm -hmm. you think that you'd be you know more perked up whatever maybe they were tired who knows like maybe they were tired because they just freaking went to the moon how did they get the video camera to live stream talking to the president from the moon <laughs> <laughs> they'd had facetime technology from the moon listen dude it doesn't make sense. A lot of things don't add up. And I think that a lot of history, I think some of it has been fabricated. Some of it. I don't think all of it. Okay. And, and that's the thing that I think that some of it, but it's like what some was, was the one that was manipulated. You know what I mean? Like what was that? Some of it <laughs> that mm -hmm. was like, you have to kind of sort of know, but yeah, look into Fomenko stuff. That like reading his stuff is like, oh man, Anatoly Fomenko new chronology where it's like he starts making parallels and he gives it a he gives you a visual so you're really able to see the parallels between a lot of these figures in history. And I don't, I don't, I don't fall in line with the oh they added time to our calendar. There, there, there's a hit. There's a 13 month. Like no, no, no. The seasons speak for themselves, okay? Like, the seasons, they change. They're on a clock. So I think that they got that part right. But, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, they changed up everything. We're not actually in... what well, one We're not actually in May. We're in XYZ. It's like, no, I don't think that's the case. But I think that a lot of these historical events were fabricated. And... I mean, think about whenever you remember something, and I, and I used this analogy the other day where it's like, you remember a childhood home, right? In your mind, you mm -hmm. visualize, if you, if, if you can visualize, because we talked about <laughs> people, people who can't, can't. <laughs> some people can't visualize, but if you can visualize, just visualize for one second in your mind, your childhood home and go back there today. And how different is your visualization of your childhood home versus the actual thing? It changes drastically, bro. And like, I remember my, my childhood home in Puerto Rico, right? That I grew up in. And I went back 15, 18 years later, however long it was after the fact, and it was completely different. <laughs> like, you know, things are out of place. Things are a lot bigger, a lot smaller, like, it's just different. So history is just like that. It's being remembered by people who probably weren't even there. And they're just taking records from an earlier guy. And, dude, I've seen it time and time again, even with occult papers where researchers will not translate part of it because it's too blasphemous for them or it doesn't align with their religion or align with their worldview. So, therefore, they leave it out. It's like, What? You know how much you're depriving people of a thousand years later on where you occulted, you literally occulted one aspect of it and it changes everything because you didn't feel, you know, it was too blasphemous for you or too gruesome or whatever it is. I've seen it time and time again, dude, where it's like, yeah, this guy didn't translate that one part. What does it say? Well, we're not going to know because he didn't translate it, you know? So it's like, you got guys like that who, are controlling its perception management, bro. They're controlling your perception, which is everything. I've said this before. It was funny. It was with another conspiracy type podcast, but they wanted to, I won't name who it was, but basically they, uh, they didn't believe in what I had said. I said, think about how many times the Bible has been rewritten. They're like, well, it's never been rewritten. I was like, there's a King James version. There's a, like, there's, Things has been changed, like maybe things here and there, but it's not the word is still the same. It's the word of God. I was like, I mean, you you mean to How tell you me, know you, you mean to tell me that a man wrote this? Like the Bible was written by man. No, the man wrote it from the word of God. That's called copium, bro. And I and I've I've seen that argument before. It's like, well, King James, that was the true word of God. It was you know reflected through him. Okay, well. You know, King James was a gay and he had lovers, male lovers, and he was also writing about demons and vampires and witches and stuff like that. You know, what does that say? It's like, well, the man is not perfect. It's like, well, how do you know? It's like back to the beginning where 
I've had people tell me, well, I talked to, I heard God speak to me. You sure about that? <laughs> you sure it was God? I mean, John, Dean, Edward Kelly thought that they were talking to angels. And then the angels were like, yeah, you got to do one more thing before we reveal to you the secrets of this reality. And we promise we're going to get there. There's one more thing you got to do for us. They were like, okay, what, what do we got to do? You got to swap wives. It's like, what? These are angels. These are archangels on the other side. And they were promising you the secrets to everything. And they want you to swap your wives. What a weird, weird request from, in, from an interdimensional galactic being that in order for them to reveal the next step to like, yep, got to cuck yourselves. <laughs> and, and they did it. I mean, that's how badly they wanted it, bro. They And that's how badly people want things sometimes, that they're able, that they will literally do whatever it takes. Because that's, in, in my opinion, people this pisses, pisses people off, but I think that faith is also another form of technology. The, the, if, if the, the most universally sought out effect, the effect that everyone wants from anything, from, from really any belief system is the placebo effect. The placebo effect is magic because essentially you use your mind to cause a, a biological change within yourself. Okay. You know how many people have been healed through the placebo effect and they don't know why like why why was he he thought he was taking the correct stuff to fix him and it came true that's what everybody wants from any magical system from any worship of any god of praying to your god and having things come to you that's that's what that's what everyone looks for the placebo effect where you bring things into existence through sheer thought and make it come true. Like, that's what everyone's looking for. Mm -hmm. like, I want to think of money and I want to be able to get money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's what every, and having faith in something so hard, the faith is the technology. Like people, and I'm not here to, to mean anyone i still believe in jesus christ i still believe in god i'm just thinking from a philosophical standpoint just before you tune out think about it you have so much faith in something that a lot of people like for me for i can speak personally i was in the church because of tradition because of my family they were in the, and therefore they made me go but how many people were in the same shoes as, as i was as a kid you know, that, that's essentially forced into the religion. But if you think about it, you meet people all the time who they've never seen God. They've never seen Jesus. They've never felt anything. They've never seen any of that. But yet they believe. They believe yeah. so hard. And and I'm, again, I'm not saying that these people didn't exist. I don't, I'm not saying that these, the biblical patriarchs and these biblical figures didn't exist because there are certain occult orders like the Rosicrucians who would use the text. And this is why I think that writing is a magical process. Because think about any major world religion. It's held together by what? By some old texts that were translated. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what all religions are. I mean, let's be real. What else? What else are really, stories? The word grammar comes from grimoire. And a grimoire is a 16th century book of spells. That's where we get the word grammar from. So when you're spelling things, you're casting them into I, I I believe in that. And the concept of believing, so writing something down, in my opinion, solidifies things into this reality. And the, these mystical orders, the Rosicrucians, were entering these texts they were entering these stories through a form of meditation and when they would enter these stories they would interact on the other side with said figures 
in these stories. Jesus, John, Paul, Peter, whatever, all these other, they were interacting with these people and they saw firsthand. So let's say that they, for the sake of conversation, let's say that they weren't historically real, but what's to say that they're not real in another dimension, in another reality that you're able to tap in through the tech i think books are portals bro mm -hmm. i think that words have power and it all goes back again to this whole idea of of visualization maybe that's why some people don't, you have to be able to visualize it dude you know a lot of the stuff that when it comes to the occult you got to be able to visualize and like we said at the beginning some people aren't able to visualize it's literally often, a characteristic of some people i've often wondered when people say they've heard like god spoke to them how do they know God spoke to them? Do they hear a voice? And does a voice in your head tell you an answer? Like, how do people... I interviewed someone recently, and he is a minister. He used to be, or he's involved with the church. He said God talks to him every day. Well, but I, for some... For some reason, I didn't think about it. I, I was thinking about it. I, just, I didn't want to ask him because I didn't want to seem like a turd or whatever but like how do you know you're talking to god i agree like, like you say god speaks to you every day how do you know because he's all around i can feel him i know he's there well yeah but how do you know it's actually god you're speaking to like there are other things that could you could be speaking to that you think is god that wants you to believe that it's god yeah well no i know i'm speaking to god that's where I like when people tell me that, that God spoke to me in a dream. Really? How do you know it was God in your dream? Well, like, this is when it when it gets into the this is another and again, this is why I believe it's important to view things from all perspectives, because it gets into the phenomenological approach where in phenomenology it's experience based. So I'm sure you talk about ufos and abductions and all that stuff what's like mm -hmm. you can't change the mind of that person you know some people are obviously going to lie and they're they're going to be full of shit right i mean there's there's always going to be that yeah but you can't you know for the person who actually truly believes it you can't strip that experience away from them because they experienced it therefore it's real to them just because you don't comprehend it or you can't understand it doesn't take away from the fact that it did happen to that person. So again, it gets into this weird realm of like kind of sort of like the observer effect where matter reacts differently when it's being observed versus when it's not. So it's like, well, if he experienced and he observed that particular moment in time, is it real? And then it's, you know, not real to me like i don't know so that's that's another approach to reality of like <laughs> there's so many facets to it and yet you want us to accept everything that you're feeding us from this one book that you know i i think that the the bible is a really interesting story i think there's a lot of stuff in there i think it's a manual on life for some people and that's cool i've read the bible there's a lot of stuff in it i like a lot of stuff in it that doesn't make sense to me. But hey, if it helps you out, more power to you. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if it makes you a better person, which is essentially what the Ten Commandments say, don't be a piece of shit and be a good person. <laughs> you know, love each other, take care of your family, love your wife, respect your parents. That's all good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like don't murder people. All right, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I won't murder somebody. Cool. It's like those are all things universally that you should be doing as a person regardless. <laughs> you don't need some friggin', you know, interdimensional sky daddy to tell you that. I mean, some people do. I mean, we're talking about people who don't have inner monologues. They can't even freaking hear themselves read a book. My so biggest <laughs> my biggest hang up, and this is where I, it really irritates me with like Christianity and a lot of things like Certain aspects to it, they believe if you're not saved, you don't ask Christ into your life. And when you die, you're going to hell because you never ask for forgiveness. Think about children that don't understand that concept. 
Oh, they go to purgatory, bro. It's it's, it's fine with them. <laughs> they, yeah. they have a like, loophole for them. Like, so to me, it's like, you're telling me that this God is so great and holy and everything else that he's going to, because your children, small children that don't understand are going to be basically stuck in purgatory or damned to hell or whatever because they didn't accept your son and ask to forgive their sins because we're all born into sin. That concept to me, I don't understand it. And it's blasphemous to say this, but if that's the way that God is, then that's not that he doesn't sound like that great of a forgiving God. I agree. So I think that is why I don't go to church. <laughs> yeah. And I've been thinking about that. It's something that I, uh, that I battle with when it, you know, when it comes to having kids, like, do you pass the tradition down? Do you not pass it down? Like, what do you do? And it's like, you know, I'll just let them get to my age. And then when they start asking questions, just explain it to them. And then just let them decide for themselves. Because I remember how it felt like to be in that situation and be, you know, have that pushed upon me. So, like, my wife and I were not religious people, but my family are. So when my children are around my parents, I will hear my daughter will come back and talk about Jesus. And I was like, okay. I don't say nothing because it's, I understand. But at the same time, it's like, I'm not going to push that on. And my older kids will come back because they went to church or something. And they come back and they tell me these things. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to church. My mom, when are you going to go to church? I'm not mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 40 years old at this point. Just leave me alone. Yeah. And again, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, but I, again, I respect everyone's decisions and what they do, but I, I completely agree with you. I think again, at the end of the day, it's a brokered experience. You can't achieve divinity if it's not through us and empty your pockets at the door. <laughs> you know, it's like, and we might put in a good word for you. You just make sure you always tune in every single week and give uh, that 10 percent and we'll be good you know we'll put in a good word for you to the big guy and i think it's all i think it's i think that part of it is bs but again like i said i do think that jesus was a real person and you know uh i've accepted jesus in my life a long time ago and regardless of all the craziness that i've read the the stuff that people don't want to talk about that they don't like about like conspiracies or like the occult or any of this other stuff is that it always leads back to God. Like it always leads back to the light, you know, because that's what it's all about. In my opinion, you know, and, and it, I know it's not cool to be like, yeah, Jesus is cool. It's like, I know Jesus isn't cool, but from all the stuff that I've read, I mean, it's all about, trying to mimic that and pervert that in some sort of way. And it's like what imitation is the, what's that one saying? Imitation is the art the of one, flattery. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. I asked the guys that wrote the book, Christ before Jesus. I was like, how come, and this is on the woo factor here, but how come when people are saying demonic stuff, or paranormal stuff, or even alien abductions, if you start saying G in Jesus' name, and you start saying in Jesus Christ or whatever, it helps people. Like, the things leave them alone. They claim to say that if you're being abducted, or whatever, you start praying to Jesus. I've heard a lot of that. So if Jesus wasn't real, Jesus didn't exist, like they're saying, why is it so prevalent in different aspects of strange things like alien abductions and like paranormal stuff, like demonic encounter, like some of the things that I've gotten into that everyone always says they like, plead the blood of Jesus, plead his name, like everything else. Like, you're told that if he's a fictional character in a book that was never true, why is there so much impact that affects different things? If, if the aliens are real and they're coming and they're abducting people, why would you pray to Jesus and they don't want to hear that name? If they're from outer space, they wouldn't even know what Jesus was. You know what I mean? So to me, that doesn't, that's where I get hung up on it. I was like, what is really going on? Like, are they even, if this is all true, 
are they actually aliens from space? Are they demons? Or like, what is that? Like, that's when you start to scratch your head. Like, and people say they've had these paranormal encounters in their house and they go around, they plead the blood of Christ and bless my house, this and that. If Jesus wasn't real, why does it work? Well, so, again, it goes back to the idea of belief. Belief. It, to, they believed that helped them and it drove away the demons. Therefore, it works. You know, hmm. and what if that's the, again, I'm, and I'm just, for the sake of conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, maybe them believing it, or maybe it's like some sort of collective egregore where, you know, you're able to tap into it <laughs> and yeah. use it for whatever, because also it's like you're some interdimensional being. Well, why do you have to probe me in the ass? Like, what what purpose does that serve? You know, why do you have to abduct the cows and do stuff to the cows? Like, what? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> like, there's a lot of things that don't add up when it comes to those, that phenomenon. And it doesn't had, make sense. <laughs> I talked to L.A. Marzulli not too long ago. And like, I didn't under, I didn't know this until I talked with him, but apparently they believe that the cattle mutilations are for breeding Nephilim. The Nephilim. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that. That's the, that's the, I guess incubators or whatever they need for it or whatever. And yeah. other people, I don't remember the RF negative, the blood type or whatever. RH negative. RF ne yeah, the they claim that's a universal blood type that people can use and they think that's what's breeding. They're using that for Nephilim too. And I was like, I have no idea. So I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> show me show me the Nephilim. No. <laughs> that's what i always say but i mean like i said dude i'm i'm a skeptic just like anybody else that's also why i'm here i study the things that i dude i'd i'd love it for bigfoot to be real i'd love it for whatever else to be real but again i think that reality's there's more layers to reality and, and the experience of being human that we got to take care of first before we can start thinking outside the box mm -hmm. of whatever crazy haunted house this is that we're living in. I've had my own weird experiences and I always say I'm very skeptical, but I'm a lot more open-minded because once you start experiencing weird stuff, it starts to make you question things which is why I do my show because there's things that I just can't explain that happened that if someone told me what had happened I'd question my own I question myself every day about it like it's something I just don't get past because it doesn't make any sort of sense but I know what I saw and I know what happened but here I am so I'm not one to pass judgment on anyone else for what they say happened because I wasn't there so I can't say you're full of shit or not yeah, you can be like Terrence Howard and say that you remember being in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I haven't actually watched the latest thing that that guy said. Wasn't he talking about alchemy and stuff recently? I only got through, I think, an hour of the, I think it's like a two and a half hour episode. And I saw enough. I mean, I mean, some of the stuff he was saying was cool, but... I wasn't there, dude. I can't prove it. Mm -hmm. And he I is an watched, actor. So. I haven't watched anything about it because you just said exactly what I was just thinking. He's an actor. So he could just be reading from whatever they wanted him to go out there and say. Anything, dude. Anything. And yeah. it is a lot of figures in history have been ridiculed, but like Nikola Tesla and every, you know, a whole bunch of other people, but I don't know. We'll have to Wait and see the world's a stage, right? And every man and woman has his entrances and exits. So see what what happens, man. Yeah. Well, we can probably wrap this one up. But before we do, I want you to let everyone know where they can find your podcast and find more information about what you're doing. You can find me, you can Google T J O J P one on one podcast on Pretty much any major podcast platform also on social media on pretty much all of them I'm also on youtube and you can go to my website tj 
ojp.com and find all my stuff there and patreon.com slash the one on one podcast all that good stuff and appreciate you having me on bro this was fun yeah not a problem i'm glad you could get on here tonight and talk with me i know it's we've played a tag back and forth trying to get this thing scheduled yeah. <laughs> our schedules don't always align i yeah. usually don't record on a weekend but sometimes i gotta make that make the effort too but i appreciate you coming on here tonight and talking with me it's been a pleasure thank you dude we'll do it yeah. again soon yep yeah, you have a good one and that's the show everyone i really hope you guys enjoyed the conversations if you would like to be a guest on tinfoil tells remember to send an email to tinfoil tells podcast at gmail.com or go to the contact section of tinfoil tells.com to get your message to me we'll get something scheduled for a future episode and just remember the truth lies in the stories we share the connections we make stay curious stay open-minded thank you all for joining us on this journey and until next time keep questioning keep seeking and keep exploring the unknown good night everyone tells in the headphones yeah it's time to rock got a story about a cryptic creature let's take a walk bigfoot dog man they're out there in the dark but the truth is out there like an alien spark ufo sightings got the whole world shook conspiracies unfold like a story in a book media control trying to keep us In history